All right, turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 this morning is where we're going to be. Have you ever been persuaded of something before and then found out you were wrong? <laughs> I have quite often, okay? Um, has anybody ever heard this morning of, of the Mandela effect? Anybody ever heard of that before? All right, my sister, Pastor Josh, okay? It, it was coined in 2013. The, the term was coined after Nelson Mandela's death in 2013. And it's basically defined as a commonly held false memory. And so the reason it's named the Mandela Effect is because many people distinctly remember him dying while in prison in the 1980s. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> okay. And they claim, they say, man, I saw it on TV. I saw his funeral on TV, and he died in 1980s in prison in uh, South Africa. Okay? He died in 2013. <laughs> but there's a commonly held misbelief. For example, all right, in the movie Snow White, the evil queen has a mirror. What does she say to the mirror? What does she say? No, she says magic mirror on the wall. Okay? But we hear things or we try to fill things in. Our mind does that a little bit. In Star Wars, Mr. Mac and me, I like Star Wars, okay? There is a famous line that Darth Vader says to his son. What is it? Oh, Mr. Mac got it right. It's not Luke, I am your father. It's no, I am your father. Okay? But many people hold to that and say, I am persuaded that this is what it says. A Kit Kat doesn't have a dash in it. Yeah, Febreze does not have two E's. It's Febrez. Okay, it's F-E-B-R-E-Z-E. -E. You can look it up, okay? <laughs> All right, but we hold to these things. There's a common uh, misbelief, a common false memory. And really, those are simple and silly things, right? But many people are absolutely persuaded that something has occur occurred the way that they remember them instead of how history has recorded them. Now, there is no history in this example to tell us who's true, but Alyssa and my wife, my wife and I have different stories of when we met each other. <laughs> okay, I am persuaded uh, that it happened in, now when I was in school they had this place called the Oasis and it was sort of a hangout place, you could buy drinks and they had like foosball and board games and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm persuaded we met there at West Coast Baptist College. She's persuaded that we met in our personal evangelism class and that her friend introduced us. <laughs> One of us is true, we don't know, okay? Um, but when we were talking about it the other night, I said, oh, I, I was coming up with a, something to use as an illustration of this. And, and she said, oh, yeah, Brother Lester, personal evangelism. I was like, I had it with Brother Furso. <laughs> Guess what? She changed real quick. Oh, no, no, maybe it was Brother Furso. I can't remember who taught the class. Okay? But sometimes you're persuaded of something. You're like, man, I know that this is true. And when you find out you're wrong, you feel really silly. right? You feel really dumb about that. Man, I can't believe I believed that. And we read our text passage this morning and our text verse. In Romans 14, 5, the Apostle Paul says that every man should be fully persuaded in his own mind. So what does it mean to be persuaded? Most of us have a general idea of what it means. Merriam-Webster's dictionary gives two definitions. But it means to move by argument, entreaty, or expost expostulation. You need a dictionary to find out what that word means. Okay? But moved by argument or entreaty to a belief position or course of action, or to plead with and to urge. So when we're persuaded, we, are, we have our arguments, we know what we believe, we are fully persuaded. The word comes from the Latin, it means to thoroughly advise or to urge. So when we think about our world today and being persuaded, there's many in our world who are persuaded of things that aren't true. Okay, things like gender and marriage and race and politics. There's a lot of things where we can say that is not true. Why? Because we have God's word, right? So we can say that is not true. There's also crazier things that people are persuaded of, like the earth is flat. Hopefully nobody here believes the earth is flat. Okay, if so, we'll talk later, okay? All right. But throughout the Bible, we see many people who were persuaded. Some were persuaded of good things. Some were persuaded of bad things. Some were persuaded of what God had told them to do while others were persuaded of things contrary to God's word. In uh, 1 Kings 22, Ahab was persuaded to go to war, even though Micaiah prophesied of his destruction. 
if he went. It's almost a humorous account because Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to Ahab, the king of Israel, and they said, let's go to war against Syria together. And so Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, because Ahab had all these prophets, and they're like, yes, you're going to go. And I think that's the one where they had the, the bull's horns. They're like, you're going to push them out of the way. And, and uh, Jehoshaphat goes, do you have a real prophet? <laughs> and Ahab, I, I, I sort of think it's funny. He goes, uh, yeah, but I don't like him. All right? He said, he never tells me what I want to hear. So Micaiah comes and he tells him, yes, go to war. You're going to be fine. And then Ahab is like, okay, tell me the truth, right? And so Micaiah tells him, he says, you know what? This is what God says. If you go, this is what's going to happen. But the kings instead ignored God's warning. They believed the false prophets. Ahab went into the battle. I think he really believed Micaiah because he went into battle dressed as a regular soldier, not a king, trying to outsmart God. And he was killed by an arrow that was let go by an archer into the air. He just sort of threw it up there, and guess who it hit? In Romans 4.21, we're told that Abraham was fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he was also, or he was able also to perform. And we've been looking at this in Sunday school as we've been starting in Genesis, working our way through. Not long ago, we looked at uh, Abraham and God's promise to Abraham that, and the promise that he would be a father of many nations. In Acts 26.28, Agrippa responds to the apostle Paul's preaching with a phrase, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa was close to being persuaded of God's truth and becoming a Christian, trusting in Jesus for his salvation, yet he let himself be persuaded by something else. We don't know what it was. Maybe it was fear, maybe it was just self-confidence, I don't know. But he was persuaded instead of the, by the preaching of the gospel by something else. In 2 Timothy 1, Paul is persuaded of the unfeigned faith of Timothy. Timothy had such a strong and vibrant faith that Paul had no doubts of his sincerity and its truthfulness. And really, if Christians today had such a faith, a faith that everyone around you could see and know that, you know what, that is an unhypocritical and a true faith. But as we look at our world around us, there's a need for Christians to be persuaded. So we're going to start a mini-series this morning. <laughs> that I believe God would have us to go through. And by his grace, we're going to cover a bunch of different topics over the next few weeks that we must be persuaded of as Christians. And I want to focus on things that really should have no debate with Christians, but sometimes we don't know. Sometimes Christians struggle or would not be willing to say that, yes, I am fully persuaded of this. These are not gray areas in Scripture. They're all found in the pages of the Bible and God's Word. And as Christians, we must be fully persuaded of these things. And as I've prayed and worked on and thought about this series, really there's so many different aspects of this faith, uh, of our faith, that we need to be fully persuaded of. We could probably go a whole year, okay? I've had a whole bunch more as I've listened to other people and preaching and reading and thinking. I thought, man, I could do this, 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 this. And I'm praying that God will direct me to the topics that he wants me to cover over the next few weeks while pastor's away. But let's pray together this morning, and we're going to start looking this morning at Romans chapter 14. Lord, uh, we do thank you for, uh, Lord, a time to be in your word, a time to spend together, Lord, uh, in worship, singing praises to you. Uh, Lord, thank you, Lord, for the songs this morning, Lord, again, staying the course, continuing on, even when times are rough. Uh, Lord, being persuaded and looking at your faithfulness to us, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us now to focus on your word, to focus on what your word has to say. And again, Lord, uh, that we would not just ignore it, that we would not just hear it, but Lord, that we would apply it into our lives. And uh, Lord, to really take stock of our lives and say, am I fully persuaded? I pray you'd use your word this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we start this series this morning, I want us to look at what it means to be fully persuaded. Okay? The passage that we're going to be looking at is, is really the entirety of Romans chapter 14. And we're going to try to answer this question of what does it mean to be fully persuaded. So the first question that we have to answer is what being persuaded, what, what, what does it not mean, all right? So being persuaded is not. What is not being persuaded? I'm messing up those words, okay? But basically, if we're looking at what is being persuaded, what is it and what is it not? And I'm convinced that all the problems that we have in our church and all the problems uh, that Christians uh, throughout the world have is because of our sin nature, no? Okay. Uh, we'll find another reason, all right? No, it's simple, but it's true. Because of our sin nature, that's what causes problems. Because we are sinners. We're often prideful. We're often full of ourselves, okay? Uh, we're too quick to judge others. And sometimes when we hear the word fully persuaded, we believe that it means that nobody else 
can disagree with me. Nobody else can differ from me and my positions, and I am always the correct one. But that's not what God means and what God, through the Apostle Paul, is trying to get across to us in this passage. So let's read verses 1 to 5 first this morning, okay? It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations, or don't judge his doubtful thoughts, the things that maybe he is struggling with, that he is unsure of. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. First of all, being fully persuaded is not a reason to judge others. It's not. Being fully persuaded is not about judging others for uh, the standards that they hold or that they do not hold. It's not for, about judging others for the things that they do or they don't do. Okay, throughout this chapter, you see Paul painting a picture of balance for us. He tells us that we shouldn't judge each other based on different standards. And the specific arguments that Paul was addressing were arguments over what food should be eaten and what special days were observed. And we might look at that and say, what's the big deal? Why are they arguing over that, okay? But think back to when Paul was writing this, all right? Early church, there were Jewish and Gentile believers, and that took a bit for the Jewish believers to accept that this is now for the Gentiles as well. We see that with Peter and, the, and God's vision of saying, okay, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Saying, no, this is for everybody. So that took some getting used to. And so we've got Jewish and Gentile believers. So Jewish believers would have been raised in a deeply spiritual home. They would have been uh, observing the law, which includes rules about what can be eaten, what animals are considered clean or unclean, what are we supposed to do with all these things, and they had a lot of different rituals and things that they did. Uh, the observing of days, it could have been aimed at both Jewish and Gentiles, but again, the Jewish believers would have had special feast days, Passover days, other days of remembrance. The Gentiles might have had some pagan holidays that they sort of pulled in and said, so, well, yeah, we, we've observed this our whole lives. What's the problem? And Paul tells the believers to receive the brethren who differ from them, but not to doubtful disputations. Don't receive them for the purpose of criticizing them, basically. Don't receive them and say, yeah, come on, and now I'm going to tell you everything that you're doing that is not quite right. But he also says to not judge another man's servant. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? He's really drawing attention to the fact that every Christian has one master. And that's not you, and it's not me, it's God. It's Jesus. And so when we judge others' spirituality or we judge their what we deem to be lack of spirituality, we are placing ourselves in the position of God. Now, I'm going to clarify one thing here, okay? I'm not saying that when somebody sins, we don't judge, okay? All right? We don't call it out is what I meant. When somebody sins... Yeah, if we're going to, we, we need to call it out, right? When Paul is talking about is this passage, he's not talking about issues where the Bible is clear. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, I'm fully persuaded I was right to do that, okay? No, 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 we call it out, okay? He's talking about things where the Bible is not black and white on. The Bible is not uh, clear about, it gives us principles, but there's not a black and white thou shalt not. So he's giving instructions about how to handle differences in areas the Bible does not give that black and white instruction on. And so this leads to the next thing that being persuaded is not. So it's not a reason to judge others, but it's also not an excuse to sin or do wrong. Because if we were to take this teaching in this passage to the full extent, if we thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I, think, I think I'm understanding this correctly, we might think, well, I can just say as long as I'm fully convinced that something is acceptable, then I can go ahead and do it. Okay? We need to understand that nowhere in the Bible are we told that sin is okay? Nowhere, including this passage. Sin is never acceptable for a Christian, and we should not be seeking to use our liberty for an occasion to the flesh, as Paul warns us in Galatians chapter 5. So what it comes down to is you cannot, okay, cannot be fully persuaded that something is right to do when God's word clearly says that it is wrong to do. It doesn't work that way, okay? You cannot say, man, I am fully persuaded, like I said earlier, I'm fully persuaded that I can commit adultery, it's fine. 
and God's word says, thou shalt not commit adultery. I can't say that I'm fully persuaded I was right when God's word says it's wrong, okay? God is not going to lead you contrary to his word. He is not going to guide you to sin against him. So being fully persuaded of the rightness, for example, of a lie in a certain situation does not negate God's command to not bear false witness. Being fully persuaded, you say, man, I can reach this unsaved girlfriend or boyfriend with the gospel, does not make God's warnings about being unequally yoked together with unbelievers suddenly disappear. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? God says, don't do this. And we say, but I'm fully persuaded I can do that. It doesn't change the fact that God said, no, you don't. Okay? And too many times we're willing to twist scripture to fit our ideas or our desires instead of taking God's word at face value. Okay, Paul is not talking about doctrine or sin in this passage. He is talking about differences and preferences and reactions to situations. Okay, so being persuaded, it's not a reason to judge others, and it's not an excuse to sin. So what does it mean? What is being fully persuaded? What does he mean by this? Let's read verses 6 to 9 now, okay? He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day... To the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God, giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. So when we look at these examples that Paul gave us, the food that was being being eaten and the days that were being observed, Paul is specifically talking of non-doctrinal issues. And the point that Paul comes to, though, is that each person needs to be assured in their own mind of what they are doing. Okay, I used that Latin etymology of the word earlier. It means to be thoroughly advised or urged. So Paul is saying, I want you as believers to be thoroughly assured of what you are holding to and what you are doing. Look at verse 23 of our text. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So being fully persuaded, it means that you are confident in what you are standing on. You are not doing it out of spite. You are not doing it just because you can You're not doing it because your flesh wants to do it. You are doing it because you believe it is right and honoring to God. And many times as Christians, we have the mindset of, well, the Bible doesn't specifically say I can't do that. So I'm going to do it. Or we hide behind saying, well, I'm fully persuaded. And we do things that we want to do, that our flesh wants to do, because there's no specific verse that addresses that specific topic. And we just saw this in verse number six, but Paul says that whatever we are doing, we are to be doing it unto the Lord. So basically, Paul is saying that if you are going to be doing something, anything, okay, make sure that you can honestly say that you are doing it unto the Lord, that he would be honored and glorified by what you are doing. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 10, 31, if I can find it. We know this verse, (laughs) and it's not 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Oh, there it is, 31. Yes, it is. All right. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I've chosen that one as my life verse because it just compasses everything, right? Whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, anything that I do, am I doing it to the glory of God? And that's really what Paul is saying. He says, okay, are you confident? Are you fully persuaded of what you are doing? Can you honestly say that I'm doing this unto the Lord, bringing honor and glory to him? So are you fully persuaded that everything you are doing in life is bringing honor and glory to God? This is honestly one of the hardest things that I find in life. Because my desire is to make sure that I am honoring God, that I'm glorifying God in all that I do, and that what I am doing is right. But there are things the Bible's not black and white on. There are things where we have a principle that we can apply, but the Bible doesn't clearly lay it out for us like thou shalt not. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm like, God, why can't you just make it simple? (laughs) Why can't you just say thou shalt not do this? Thou shalt not do that. And make it black and white. But the searching of Scripture, the praying and asking for God's direction, that's a part of what helps us grow closer to God, right? 
That's how we grow in him. And the problem I find, though, is that with some of these choices and decisions, my flesh leans one direction. Okay? Now, that direction might not be sinful, but it's what I want to do. And for me, the challenge is saying, okay, that's not sinful. I can do that, but am I going this way because I want to, or am I going this way because God wants me to? Do you see the difficulty? Hopefully, some of you have experienced that in your life because that's part of growing as a Christian. We say, okay, I can do this. It's okay, but should I do this? I want to do this, but is this honoring and glorifying to God? As a Christian, our desire should be to do what God wants us to do, not what we want to do. And it's easy to brush off conviction about something that you're doing by saying, well, I'm persuaded I can do this. Or to say, I can do this because the Bible doesn't say that I can't. Uh, I talked to a guy yesterday at the apologetic seminar, seminar from Pastor Paul's church, and uh, he had a question about something, and uh, he was talking to somebody else from Pastor Paul's church, and he said, hey, this guy's a pastor. I was like, great, thanks. No. <laughs> it was good, though. It was a good conversation. But what was interesting, he's a new Christian, and he said, as I grow and I continue to grow, some things just start not to feel quite right. That's what should be happening with all of us, even if you're an old Christian, okay? You should be growing to the point where you say, you know what? I was convinced that this was okay, and now I don't think so. And that's okay. Change is okay. Did you know that? Okay. Uh, I was talking to Brother England about this too. Uh, the, uh, Dr. England, he did the sessions at the apologetic seminar. But he said, if you don't change, you're not growing. Growth does require sometimes that we say, oh, I was wrong on that. I need to change. Or, oh, I've studied God's word more and I fully understand something more. So I've slightly changed something here, or I've slightly changed something there, or I've said, oh, you know what, I can't do that. That's not okay. So are you fully persuaded that what you are doing is honoring God? Are you fully persuaded that what you are doing is not sinning against God? Are you fully persuaded that you aren't just feeding your flesh and your wants and your desires? Let's keep reading, all right? Verse 13 to 23 now. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy him not with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Now let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense." It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Did you notice anything in verse 13? Start of verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. This is where our sin nature comes in, okay? If we don't do something, we think we're better than those who do do it, right? I have higher standards than so-and-so, okay? If Again, this could be the kind of music you listen to, the things you watch, the kind of clothes you think are okay to wear, okay? And if we're on the other side of the coin, we might feel like that because we can do something, then we become prideful in the fact that we are enlightened enough, right? I know it's not wrong. I'm enlightened and they're just poor, poor people, right? But both of those attitudes are contrary to what we just read in our passage, Both of those attitudes are contrary to what God teaches us. Paul tells us that instead of judging others, we should instead be judging ourselves. Don't look to others to judge what they're doing. We need to instead be looking at our motives and our actions and making sure that we are not being a stumbling block to others. 
Okay? Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Don't judge everybody else anymore, but instead judge this, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And in verse 14, Paul follows this up by saying, I'm persuaded that there's nothing unclean. (laughs) There's nothing unclean of itself, he says. I'm persuaded of that. But then he says, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So Paul says, I am fully persuaded there's nothing unclean of itself. But if you are persuaded and said, that is wrong, I should not do it, then it is unclean to you because you are fully persuaded. Okay? And so... Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 8 as well when he talks about not eating meat and the, and the meat that was coming before them and the meat offered to idols, all that kind of stuff. In verse 15 of Romans 14, it says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. But it says, Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. I mean, how sobering is that? We have the power to build up and to edify one another or to destroy one another simply by where we lie with our preferences. He says, you can destroy your fellow brother and sister with your meat. Okay, uh, again, if it's, if, for example, all right, if I say I'm okay to do this and you say it's not okay to do that and I convince you to come do it with me, I have just convinced you to sin because you say I cannot do that. I am convinced. Paul just said, I'm convinced nothing is unclean, but if it's unclean to you, then it is unclean. Okay? And so Paul says we can destroy them with our meat, with our liberty, because we're not thinking about others. So instead of being so focused on ourselves and what we can do because we have liberty, instead we should be thinking of the others who may not be where we are at yet. Or may never get to where we're at. <laughs> and to maybe limit what we do and what we say around them so that they are encouraged in the faith, not torn down in it. In 1 Corinthians 8, I just mentioned it. Paul says in verse 13, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So contrary to world's, the world's viewpoint, huh? That's what I love about the Bible, okay? What I love about our faith is it's so contrary to everything the world teaches. That everything is so contrary to everything else that is taught by religions in the world. Paul says, you know what? I'd rather prefer you over myself. Because that's what Christ showed us. That's what Christ has taught us. So Paul had the freedom to eat meat. And yet he loved his fellow believers so much he was willing to forgo something that was clean and okay for him to do. It wasn't a sin. But he said, I'm going to forgo that. I'm going to put that aside so I don't offend others. Verse 21 of our text. Paul says, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. The Christian life is not supposed to be all about me and what I can or cannot do, but instead about Christ and others. We should in honor prefer one another. And we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. We find some of that back in Romans chapter 12. In verse 22, Paul gives us something else to think about. He says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. So if you can say, you know what, I am fully persuaded of what I am doing. I know that what I am doing is not sin. I know that it is honoring and pleasing to God, and I can do this in a good conscience before God. That's great. But Paul does warn us to think about our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and not just about ourselves. He says, if you have faith, if you're fully persuaded, great, practice that liberty to thyself before God. Oftentimes we're like, well, I know I can do this. I know that's not sin, so they could just get over it. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what God has told us. There are some things that you might be fully persuaded on, but know that others aren't. And you can still enjoy the liberty and the freedom that you have in Christ to do whatever it might be without flaunting it and putting a stumbling block in front of other Christians. Does that make sense? Everybody's looking at me blankly this morning, so. Okay? There are some things that maybe I say I am okay to do this, But then I know Pastor Josh is like, ah, that's not okay. When Pastor Josh comes to my house, I'm not going to flaunt it in front of him and be like, what's your problem, Pastor Josh? It's okay. (laughs) I'm not going to do that because I'm going to hopefully, in honor, prefer one another. 
And as Christians who are sinful beings, we don't get rid of all of our sin, okay? When we're saved, we don't become sinless. So as sinful beings, we have pride that comes in and says, well, what is their problem? Why don't they prefer me over them? Okay? The Christian life, again, it's not about me. It's about God and it's about others. But oftentimes we turn it inward and say, it's all about me. You cater to me. You cater to me. In Paul's context and in his day, This meant, like we saw in 1 Corinthians 8, that even though he believed that maybe eating a specific meat or a food was not wrong, he was going to abstain when a brother who did feel that it was wrong was present because he didn't want to cause him to fall. In our sense, again, it may mean that even if you believe a certain kind of music or dress or TV show or whatever, you say, oh, that's fine, it's no problem. You will show respect to those who don't think it is and refrain from it around them. And I will be clear, there are types of music and there are types of things we watch on TV and there's are types of things that we look at that God says are wrong, okay? It should not look to lust upon a woman, okay? So if you're looking and you're lusting, you're wrong. You can't say, well, I'm fully persuaded, that's okay, all right? It doesn't work that way. Back in verse 15, Paul says, if thy brother be grieved with with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. If our brother is grieved by what we are doing and if we're flaunting it in front of them saying, what's your big deal? With no thought of them, Paul says you're not walking in love for your brother. Now, this doesn't mean that you take advantage of others who are striving to act and behave as they have been convicted and then make it all about you. Okay, think about it. If I believed one thing about an issue and you believed differently and we both decided to obey God's direction here in Romans 14 and obey some of the instruction that we see in 1 Corinthians 8, guess what? We wouldn't have problems. Because I wouldn't be crying out that I'm the weaker brother, you need to cater to me, okay? And you wouldn't be crying out that, well, I have liberty, so I don't care what you think. Because it wouldn't be about me. Okay, when I say I'm the weaker brother, cater to me, guess what I've made it all about? Me. When I say I have liberty and you just need to get over it, I've made it all about me. I haven't thought about the other. I haven't walked charitably towards the other. Instead, we would be preferring one another if we followed Romans 14, which means that, you know what? I might not do something that you think is wrong, and you wouldn't judge me even if you knew I did it in private. (laughs) That's really what it comes down to. You might say, well, I know that Pastor John Mark does this. I think it's wrong, but I won't judge him for it because I don't see a clear black and white God says don't do this. (laughs) And I wouldn't be judging you in the same way. Or I wouldn't do what I was going to do or what I think I have freedom to do with you around because I don't want to cause you to fall. I'm thinking about you, you're thinking about me instead of thinking about ourselves. Verse 19 of our passage. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Are you following after the things which make for peace? And the things wherewith one may edify another. So being persuaded is not a reason to judge others. It's not a reason for you to say, well, I'm going to use it so I can sin. It is thinking about others above ourselves. But why should we be persuaded? Why does this all even matter? Look at verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. It matters because each one of us here this morning will someday stand before God and give account of ourselves. If you've never trusted in Christ, then judgment really has been made. You will spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell unless you turn to Christ for salvation. As a Christian, we're not judged by our sin. Christ has already made that payment for us, but our actions will be judged. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I will not give account for my wife. I will not give account for my children. I will not give account for any of you here. Okay? I will give account to God for myself. 
Now, part of that is pastoring, and so I'll give account for how I pastor, but I'm not going to give account for so-and-so's sin in the church. Does that make sense? Okay? I will give account for how I father and how I am a husband and how I behaved in those situations, but I won't give an account for what my children do or what my wife does. But I will give account for myself. So being fully persuaded matters because one day you're going to stand before God and you're going to give account for your life. And I want to be able to stand before God and not have my works burned up because they were meaningless. But I want to instead have something to lay at his feet. I want to be able to stand before God and say that, you know what, God, I was fully persuaded in everything that I did. Let's read verse 23 one more time before we close. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you are doubtful, if you are wavering, just don't do it. If we can't do it in faith, then God tells us that it is sin. My kids, like Patch the Pirate, they're, they're getting older now, so we're more in Adventures and Odyssey, but Patch the Pirate has a song, if it's doubtful, don't do it. It's pretty simple. Okay, take time to pray and think through it. That's the song, okay? And they're teaching kids that if it's doubtful, if you don't know, can I do this or not do this, don't do it. Take time to pray and think through it. They're teaching these principles. So if you're doubtful, if you're wavering, just don't do it. If you can't do it in faith, God says it is sin. So my question really tonight is, are you fully persuaded, or this morning? Are there things that you are allowing in your life that you are not fully persuaded are honoring to God? Paul said that whatever we are doing, we are to do it unto the Lord. So can you say that everything you do and you say and you watch and you think on and you dwell on and the way you treat others, can you say all of that is I'm doing it unto the Lord? Is everything in your life honoring to God? We need to be able to say that I am persuaded when it comes to our standards, to our decisions, and to how we are living our lives. Because one day we will stand before our Savior and we will give account of our lives to Him. And for me, I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to be able to say, Lord, I was fully persuaded. So can you say this morning, I am persuaded? Let's pray. Lord, do thank, thank you for your word.